Go ahead, Karen. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you everyone for joining us. Linda Hochstein is going to be joining us at one point in time, but until then, we will get started with our documents on working with the purchase and working with the buyer and how to put that together um, and what we need to move forward with that. And then as I see Linda come on, uh, we'll skip over to her and then go back to our documents afterwards. So, let me share my screen. And as always, we're gonna work with one of my live clients because I'm actually still an active agent and I still do work. So we always start off with our MLS sheet so that we know what we're working with. This is uh, 12225 Kennedy Boulevard. On here, I'm going to need the agent's information. I'm going to need how much they're paying out. I'm going to need the amount, uh, the lot and block, taxes, the MLS monthly fee, according to the MLS. If anything is included or excluded, I'm going to need all those details. So I need the MLS sheet. I also need the tax record. You find the tax record by hitting up top where it says tax, New Jersey tax records. Once it bring us to that screen, we want to look for a property search by street. We already know that it's in Hudson County, it's in Bayonne, Kennedy Boulevard. And we know the building is 1225. And then the unit is always on the MLS generally. And in this case, it's unit 9J. So two reasons, a few reasons why we pull a tax record. We want to verify that the blocking lot is right. We don't want to take what's on the MLS because the agent could have made a mistake. We want to make sure that we have the square footage, the right taxes, the seller's information, um, and generally if it's a condo or two family or three family or one family, it will tell you here and it's here uh, description, building description. So this 13 stories is a brick building there's 144 units in their condos. I have an actual sheet I'll send out later, I'll put it in the internet that tells us the building descriptions and all what the BTs and the Hs and the Cs, all what that mean. I'll put that in the internet so that you'll know when you're looking at the building description, what you're actually looking at. For now, we're gonna save that into our uh, drive. so that we could always refer to it. And we're gonna save our MLS sheet. Print the agent copy, because these are all gonna become part of our document when we upload it. into command. So with those two documents, we're going to get started. Everybody remember how to create a contact? For those who don't know, because I can't see all the heads, I'm just going to create my famous Mickey Mouse. Uh, see out the way. We're going to add a contact, a full name, I need to start adding one, two, and three because I keep using the same one. You're going to mark it as a lead. We 
You're going to tag them as a buyer because that's what we're working with today, the buyer side. And we're going to create our contact. And then when we go to search, we'll see Mickey Mouse come up. Today I just created him Mickey Mouse one. Uh, so you see that it's a buyer. So once we have our lead, we can start our opportunity. And to start an opportunity, you also have to create that. So you hit create an opportunity, and then you begin to put that information in. You know you're working with the buyer, so we're looking at the buyer side, and then we're gonna go find our client. I start typing in, you see all the clients will start coming out. Now I use Mickey Mouse one, so I need him to come up, and he's not coming up. So I'll just grab Mickey Mouse because that's what we're doing. Estimated closing date. If you have cash, a cash closing can close anywhere from 14 days to one month, generally 14 to 30 days. Because the only thing really in cash after attorney review is you're doing your home inspection and you're doing um, title. Title generally take about two weeks, pre-corona. With corona, you might need a little bit more. If you're doing FHA, FHA clients generally take 60 days. So your, your closing is gonna be anywhere from 45 to 60 days. If you're doing a conventional, meaning you put in 3%, 5%, 10%, 20%, 20%, or even 30% or whatever percentage down, and it's conventional, that usually takes 45, 30 to 45 days. So in this case, I'm working with a cash buyer and we're gonna to try to close by the end of the month. Now keep in mind, when there's holidays, um, people close early, especially even Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, New Year's. So don't schedule your closing date too close to the holiday. In this case, Halloween is the 31st. Some people don't like coming out mischief night, which is the 30th. So I'm actually going to change that to the 29th. Time frame, one month. Again, if you was working with conventional or FHA, then you do the three month out. The budget in this case is the list price is 180, 190. My client only wants to offer 180. The commission, you're going to grab the commission again offer your MLS sheet down at the bottom. You see it down here, it says BA, BAC, that's a buyer agent. TV, transaction broker. We generally working as a buyer agent. So it's gonna be the 2.5 minus the 275. I gotta remember which one I was in. I got too many screens open. I'm gonna close some screens out. All right, there we go. So this is 2.5. They just asked them for the percentage. Uh, this is active. We're in a negotiation phase and we're gonna create. Now if we were in a negotiating and you was just setting an appointment, you'll be in appointment and you'll be in scheduling. And if they scheduled or if they kept it. In this case, we are ready to the active and we are ready in the negotiation. And then I'm gonna hit create which is gonna bring you to this screen. This screen is gonna ask for some details, general information and a property. So general information, there's a little pencil up there, it's faded out, you really can't see it, but when you hover over it, you can see where it's darker. Uh, you're gonna select, you're the owner, so you don't have to worry about that. Custom tag, don't worry about that. Contact name, again, is Mickey Mouse. Uh, opportunity phase stage that's all fine you already put that in there if you did the appointment then you could put the date you did the appointment uh in this case it was the 24th for me um behind there the appointment date again it was on the 24th agreement one we haven't won it yet contract date that was written Contract date that we uh, it was written. I wrote this on Friday, so for Friday's date. 
close date. Again, we're going to put the 29th of October because this is cash. We don't need that much time to close. Financing type over here. FHA, VA, USDA, owner or none. Um, USDA, I'm going to assume that's cash. I really don't know, but we're doing cash. It's not conventional FHA. And then we're going to hit save. And then that satisfies that side. Now on this side, you also have this pencil. We're working in the United States of America. An address, if you start typing it, it will come up. I remember that this is 144 units, so I need to put the apartment number so we know which apartment we're dealing with. And we're gonna hit save. Now that we have this part of these details saved, we can actually go to our document. How do we get our do document? We start a transaction. That's the first thing, start transaction. You can use DocuSign or you can use dot loop. I choose to use DocuSign. It's your choice, whichever one you're comfortable with. It's gonna ask you for your passwords, your login information. If you knew, it's gonna ask you for your NARJ number. Um, if you're just setting up, you might need to access your NARS number. The documents that you're going to need, uh, you have your details on this side. Now, the details you put in the beginning is totally different from the details. It's not different, but it's a different section. So you still have to enter your details on this side. You're going to have to enter your seller information on your right. If it's two sellers, the listing agent, the, if it's two listing agents, the buyer, if it's one or two buyers, the buyer agent, which would be yourself. You are the buyer agent. Or your information details. And if you're working with two buyer agents, then that second buyer agent information. That's all on the right side. On your left side, it's all about the property. Um, the address, the location of it, any other details for the offer, um, highest and best. And you don't have to put everything that's over on this side, just what applies. So I'm actually gonna go on one out already did. I just wanted to bring you up to this point so that you can see but I'm going to go to the one that is actually already filled out in my, in my loop. So you see, you got listings up here and we're working with buyers. I got seven cultivated buyers I'm working with. There's two that have appointments. There's one that's active. There's two that's under contract. This is where you see your pipeline of your activities. Well, if you're working with listings, you'll see it up here. If you're working with tenants, you'll see it down here. Today, we're focusing in on buyers, so we're going to pick the buyer. Here's the buyer I'm working with. When you click on the buyer, you'll see how I put all the information in on that side already. I put the property information in. Click on document, go to my transaction. You see all my documents come up of what I need. Now, sometimes you're gonna work with older people and everything is manual. So you're gonna have to get everything print everything and take it with you and go sit face to face with them because they don't have computers or they don't know how to use their laptop or their tablet or their smartphone or they got a flip phone. And then they might just get you know, frustrated because 
they're not computer inclined. So that's when you have to take the time, print all your documents out, and physically go to your client's house and go over these documents with them. So our first um, document is the consumer information statement. Anytime you're showing property or dealing with property, you need to, they, you need, the buyer needs to know how you're working with them, whether you're just a buyer's agent for them or whether you're a disclosed dual agent. Do anybody know the difference between a buyer agent versus a disclosed dual agent? Yeah, uh, a buyer agent just works for the buyer, disclosed works for the buyer and the seller. What, what constitutes or generates you automatically being a disclosed dual agent? Well, Karen, would that mean um, a, disclo a disclosed agent, say, as <clears throat> we're both Keller Williams agents, but you're the listing agent and I bring the buyer, then that would make me a, dual, a disclosed dual agent as well. Exactly. So it has to be a Keller Williams property that we both represent in the buyer and the seller. You may never speak to my seller or I may never speak to your buyer or vice versa, but because we're under the same umbrella, um, we all working for the same office, we automatically become a disclosed dual agent to any properties listed here at 190 Christopher Columbus or our Bayonne location, which is still under 190 Christopher Columbus. So we automatically become disclosed dual agent. This one, you go back to the MLS, we see it's Wicket Realtors, we're a buyer's agent, automatically a buyer's agent. Any information we find or any information that listing agent cares to reveal, we can take all that information back to our buyer as a buyer agent. As a disclosed dual agent, we can't give any unfair advantage of one party over the other party. So if I know that the seller will take 185, I can't say to the buyer, um, don't put in 190. I know they'll take 185. Just hold off. Or if I know the buyer can go up to 190 but only put in 180, I can't say to the seller, he can come up, hold out. That's giving one party an unfair advantage over the other party, and that's not right. You can't do that as disclosed to agent. However, if I'm working as a buyer agent and it's not a uh, Keller Williams property, or Everything is fair game. You say it, I can tell my buyer and give my buyer any, any advantage over your seller as a buyer agent. So that's one reason why when we're doing our offers, we want to call and speak to the agent. But sometimes in a the text, they may not tell us much. But if we call them, try to see where they sell it is, what they sell it want, what they sell it looking for, they might be a little too over talkative and give you all the details you need to help you sell your buyer when that uh, offer. So it's always good, pick up the phone and call. So in this case, on this document, you wanna make sure at the bottom that your name is on there. In this case, I'm Karen and Sims. I am a um, buyer agent only because this was not a wife of property. Now all my documents is done. I just forgot to upload them into the computer. So unfortunately, I'm still gonna have to go through each one. Um, I just won't be filling them out. I'll just tell you what needs to be done and which ones. Gravity, KW, City Life, Jersey City. We have a title company that we're affiliated with. She actually will be speaking um, in October to introduce herself, which is Pamela Lee. And uh, she'll be bringing to us what they do for us as a company and why we use this document. So in this case, on here, if you put all your details in, each document will carry those details to the next document. So you're not rewriting everything on each single piece of paper. So I brought over my buyer, brought over the property address. And all I have to do is when I make, when I go to DocuSign, make sure um, I upload the signature. So this document is actually done. Do anybody know what title, why we need title? That would be um, <clears throat> to search um, and make sure that there's there never been any liens on the property who were the previous owners <clears throat> and such like matters. 
Correct. make sure there's no discrepancies with the property. Is your insurance, is your insurance that the title company has vetted the property and made sure that nobody has any claims against it. So title is generally state regulated. Um, I wouldn't get into those amounts with anybody. Just pretty much tell them to uh, speak with their attorney if they ask you about amounts. But just know that it's state regulated. So um, one title company to the next title company is gonna be within a similar price point. I'm going to save that document. Our next document is our attorney vetted list. And these are some of the attorneys that we work with. And again, um, just make an introduction so that we know some of the attorneys so that when you referring them to your clients, uh, you're already familiar with them and this way it is not an awkward transfer. Um, you met them, you saw them, you heard their voice um, and then it becomes an easy transfer when you in the um, streets and your clients like, okay, well, I need an attorney, can you recommend? You're not like, uh, 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 you already know, well, I've met with Marty Brodsky, I met with Linda Hoxing, I met with Laura. Um, these are some attorneys that, you know, we deal business with and they're, they're awesome attorneys. Um, but my job is to make sure that you're aware of all of them and we got a long way to go, but we'll get through the whole list so that you become familiar with them. Save them in your phone because when you're out in the street and you're trying to do things in a rush, you're not, you don't have time to look for this attorney list, but if they're in your phone, you just share it with your clients, share it with your clients, share it with your clients, and then they're like, oh, you're a superstar. You know everything. You got everything. I actually in this there. So save title, save uh, the attorney vetted list in your phone so that when you speaking with them or, you know, rolling around or watching properties, looking at properties, you have this information when it comes to the mask. Now the commission bill, we don't worry about the commission bill until we're actually ready to get paid. So you don't have to worry about doing that anything to that one right now. Affiliated business disclosure. Again, we have uh, other companies besides Gravity Title that we work along with that we may refer to. Um, and it's just a disclosure. They're not agreeing to work with Gravity Title. They're not agreeing to work with Loan Depot or Guarantee Rate or State Farm. We just letting them know that we have relationship with these ones and if they want to, uh, they can use them or they're free to shop around. So this is just a signature page. The computer, if you put everything in, you'll see that the computer already brought the dress down to the bottom. Our next document is condominium Home Insurance homeowners association. So if you're working with a condo of one family, two family, three family, you're gonna need different addendums. If it's a three family, this is the condo and the other one will be a three family, family addendum. There's no addendum for one or two. Um, pretty much on here, uh, the association information, and again, that might not be on the MLS. You might have to get that from the agent. Most of the time it's not on the MLS. In this case, before he put the information on the MLS, he had it at $639 and he had the taxes at 22. He didn't give me the information. I tracked down to our own agents and got the information from the uh, one of our agents on the property management. And then I called the property management up, up myself I was able to get the correct monthly and the correct taxes based on the tax record. So do every extra step just to make sure that your client can afford the expenses because he had 2018 there and I know it can't be $2,280 when another unit, same structure, same line was 4,000. So sometimes you have to do that extra research just to make sure that you're giving your client all the information possible that you can, correct information. But this is what this document is gonna help. 
and then you put in the maintenance fees of 657. All my stuff is manually, was manually done. I'm just explaining the, the document itself. If you're aware of there's any assessments on the building, that will go there. Um, and then the signatures. And again, the computer brings over the address for us. Coronavirus, uh, we didn't have these documents prior to March, but now we have these documents, so they become legitimate parts of the contract. New Jersey uh, Realtors, their document that's required. So this one actually gives the buyer the opportunity if for some reason they come in contact with coronavirus and they get sick, they get ill and they need to cancel the contract or need to extend it, the seller is already agreeing to extend the closing up to 30 days. Now, even though it says if it's left blank, it'd be 30 days. But what if it's left blank, you send it over to the agent and the agent put in 15 days, you get the paperwork back, you never notice that that blank line that you left for 30 went down to 15. Now you sell, your buyer only have 15 days to respond, you know, respond if they get coronavirus. So even though it's blank, I would still put in the 30 days. And then you would click here. If they're unable to get the mortgage, they can, or close, they can cancel the contract. This really protects the buyer, it doesn't protect the seller. Because now if they can't close, we gave them 30 days, we just lost 60, 70 days on the market because of this document, but there's nothing we can do. People are protected with HIPAA laws. We can't even question or ask to see documents or proof that they got coronavirus or anything. Can't do it. It's a violation of their HIPAA laws. They just have to honor this contract. Our next doc document, we're gonna come back to the actual contract itself. I just wanna get through all the paperwork. Exclusive buyer agency agreement. Again, this document we're working with the buyer. We want the buyer to be loyal. Buyers are not always loyal. Sometimes buyers are liars. Um, but this helps protect us and our commission. Can we say that again? <laughs> Help protect us and our commission. Since this is in reference to this uh, contract, I'm gonna put them on speaker. If y'all could be quiet, um, yeah, I see if we're gonna get this deal. Hey, Nicholas, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Did you get my text? Uh, no, I didn't get your text. What's up? Oh, that's why well, I'm calling. Okay. I have a very, have a very uh, bland boy, happy happy go lucky personality, and I laugh a lot in life. You got an accepted offer. Awesome. Thank you so much. I will call my client. Let's get this party started. I put emojis and everything. <laughs> All right. I got to check my, my uh, email and I'm going to let my uh, client know and get the contract okay, over to uh, Linda. No, no, no. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. <clears throat> she just told me over the phone she accepted it and she sent me the contract signed. Okay. This is the thing, though. I'm going to the doctor. I got to get x-rays on my shoulder. I'm going to New York City. When I come back from New York City, I'll forward you to sign the sign contract where you do have an accepted offer. All right. Thank you so much, Nick Nicholas. I hope you feel better with your uh, shoulder. I know, man. It's killing me. It is killing me. <laughs> but, yeah, I got to go get some x-rays. When I come back, I'll forward you, all right? All right. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Send me attorney's right. information bye -bye. too. Bye bye. Oh yeah, the, the attorney is uh Gruffin. I'll send you the attorney information. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Very good. I offer got accepted. So Yolanda, you were saying say that again. Exclusive by agency agreement. This will hopefully, because it's not ironclad but hopefully it keeps us where our buyers are exclusive to us and we get paid at the end of the day for working with them and doing our job. However, you have to make sure you don't abandon your client 
You have to make sure that they know that you can show them anything that comes to you. You have to make sure if they go into an open house that they make sure they let the agents know they're already working with an agent. Um, and you have to follow through as the agent to make sure that you're getting them in front of properties and becoming a procuring cause. Does that answer your question, Yolanda? Yeah, it does. I was just laughing at your, your little humor about buyers are liars. Oh, you want me to say that part again? Oh, okay. <laughs> Not all buyers. But Not a lot. all buyers, but... <laughs> a lot do. So the agency is uh, the buyer, Grace, in this case. The brokerage is our brokerage. Municipalities uh, would be Jersey City, Bayonne. Those are two areas that I was looking with her. Uh, does she have another business relationship? It's either yes or no. If you're working with them as they buy agent, you will hope, always want this to be no. Business relationship, yourself, name of your firm, again, Keller Williams City Life, JC, you're a buyer agent, and it's the opportunity to arise, disclose dual agent. The terms of the list, this lease will commence on the day that you show. So in this case, I think Thursday was the 24th, so it was 9-24-2020. It was fired on the 24th day, and then usually I put three months out. Some people put six months out. We just had an... Um, I'm not sure if anybody on Mega Camp was in that class, but somebody got two years exclusive by agency sign. So it all depends on how you want to work with your clients. Uh, you know, after three months, definitely if you want to continue, just make sure you extend it. Uh, the brokerage fee is 2.5%. You can put 3%, but the average broker fee and, and buyers are smart. They do their research and the average broker commission that we get paid is two and a half percent. So I always generally stick with two and a half percent. Doesn't mean that you can't do three or three and a half percent. Um, but this pretty much state, if you find something that's not on the MLS, that they will pay you that two and a half, three or three percent. Um, and then within 90 days, it could be terminated. So if you started from September 24th and it's expired, ends December 24th, and then you put an additional 90 there, they're really under agreement with you until next March of 2021, because that 90 days is an extension of the 24th when it ends. And your name would go there, and they would sign. Your next document will be, uh, we did the informed consent to do it, but we did exclusive by agency. Informed consent to dual agency, just like the seller has to give you permission, the buyer also has to give you permission to represent them and the buyer. So the last week, remember with seller up here, you see now it's buyer up here. You in this case, myself, our company, our name, for the brokerage name, and then 190 Christopher Columbus, Jersey City, New Jersey, 07302, our address. The buyer will sign, and if it's two, then it'd be both buyers. Lead-based paint. If you notice, this lead-based paint is blank. So you never want your client to f sign a blank lead. Doesn't tell me if they have any reports. It doesn't tell me if they have knowledge. You got to go to the MLS. Over here you have key. M is for the map. D is for document. T is for the tax. Click on your D and you see the lead-based paint. And then you will upload this. Download it onto your desktop. And then you will upload it into your documents so that your client is signing something that actually have 
information on it and not just blank. So while I have that, I'm going to upload all the documents, the tax records and the MLS sheet and the lead. So that now that become part of my permanent room or my permanent folder. So on this lead, you see the seller has an issue that they have no reports. They have no knowledge. They have an issue that they have no reports. My buyer is going to an issue that they have the statement, which is, this is the statement up top. They're going to uh, an issue that they received the copy of the information listed above, which is this information right here, that they have received the pamphlet. That's the pamphlet that we give them electronically and that they had the opportunity to have an inspection if they so choose. Never waive anybody inspections to anything because it could come back and bite you and say, my realtor say waive it. Always give them the, to the opportunity to do any type of inspections, including their lead. And then they would sign it and you would sign it as well as the uh, buyer agent, buyer tenant agent and the purchaser. Um, next we will have the whole harmless. This document you should be signing up front when you go to see properties. Um, so it would be the date that you go out and see the property and the property address. Uh, pretty much if they come in contact with coronavirus exposed, um, if they've been traveling, they pretty much is going to let you know um, that they are high risk if they are in that field as a buyer, they may be a policeman, a fireman, an ambulance worker, a nurse, a doctor. So they automatically will be ex excluded because this is their everyday job. So they um, would be in contact more than likely with the coronavirus. So we just want to make sure we have it on file that if they do come in contact with this, they're not suing you, the agent. They're not suing us. Keller Williams, and they're not suing a seller, whoever is the seller of that property, should they uh, contact coronavirus. And then our last thing will be to make sure we have the contract. Well, the wire, which is still, got to figure out why we have it twice, because it's going to be at the end of the contract, too. But the wire as agents, we never give no type of wire instruction. If our clients ever say they saw an email come from Karen Sims um, and told, and Karen told them to send a wire to another account, that's not true. As agents, we never give wire instruction. Um, therefore, this is why we have them sign the wire fraud notice. So that if anybody's doing a scam, they know it didn't come for us. If they should get a call or anything, we tell them to uh, call their attorney directly um, and do not call that number back. And definitely do not send anything. If the attorney told them to do one thing, do not do anything else unless they call their attorney first. But from us, we never give instructions on wiring, guys. Save and close. Now, the whole exciting thing is our actual contract. First page of your contract is your opinion 26 or your notice. Uh, again, how are we working for this client? Are we a seller? We work for the seller. Not the buyer, do we represent the buyer, not the seller? Do we represent the both the both the seller and the buyer? Or do we represent neither? If we represent neither, that's a transaction broker. In this case, I represent the buyer, not the seller. Also on here, 
they had three days to get an attorney from when they signed a contract, when the seller signed a contract, and when it get back in both of their hands. They had three days to get it to the attorney. If they don't choose to get it to the attorney, this contract becomes binding and they're in obligation to the contract according to what they signed. So it's important that they get an attorney. Down here is the person who prepared it. In this case, it would be my name. I'm the selling agent. So buyer agent, working for the purchaser, selling agent, selling broker, that's on me, Karen. I know it sounds confu confusing when it says selling because you think it's the seller, but it's the one selling the property which is working for the purchaser. And I believe Hoxine just got in. So I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. And there she is. <laughs> I think you're on mute. Uh, first of all, hello, everyone. I'm so sorry I had this at 3 o'clock. Yeah, two to three. <laughs> it's okay. I'm We're so going sorry. So everyone, this is Linda Hoxing. She's been with me probably 18 years of my career as well. Um, she's from Bayonne. She's a wonderful attorney. She has a staff. Um, and she works sometime on the weekends and get your answers in. So I love Linda and Linda's gonna take it over for us for a little bit. I am so sorry. It's really nice to meet everybody. So I see some, okay, now I see your names. Okay, wonderful. So um, I have, my office is in Bayonne. I'm home today. It's actually um, a holiday for me. It's, a, it's Yom Kippur. So I am, where, I am home. Um, so I'm sorry I missed the, the beginning. I have been in private practice for um, about 24 years. So I am happy and eager to help you answer questions. Even if I'm not on that particular file and you have a question or an issue and you're not exactly sure how to go about something, please always feel free. You can reach out to me um, by phone, by email. As Karen said, I'm probably too accessible. I check emails as early as 5.30 in the morning before my kids get up. And sometimes throughout the uh, weekend, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, um, but certainly during the week, I have a fantastic staff. I have two other attorneys with me and a full-time admin person. Um, so we really work really, really hard to include all of you in every correspondence uh, and, and all throughout the entire process. So. I missed the beginning, shoot over, holler, some questions. What, what can I help you with? Basically, we're starting to go over the contract um, and working with buyers. And we have our attorney Reddit list. And it's easier if they know you, if they see you. This way, when they doing that warm transfer from their clients to you, they already know who Linda is. And this way, it makes it easy for them um, to work, to refer their clients over to you. So I, I, that's basically where we left off. We're just going to finish up the contract. Okay, I'm 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 ready. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> so Linda, how about um, I finish sharing my screen, and as we go and do the contract, if there's anything you want to jump in, because we did all the other documents, we just sat the contract, so probably another 15 minutes, and then you can jump in as you uh, as I'm going over and explain it, and then you can bring out anything that might be helpful to us. Perfect. Thank you. So we were just at the first page, which was the opinion 26 and making sure you get your attorney and the importance of having that attorney that can change everything for you. Then this is the actual contract. We have Grace and this is, going, this is a live um, contract, Linda, and it's gonna be your contract. We just won it like literally 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you so uh, much. That's so great. 
so we problem. can do that together. Yeah. So this is Grace Cooper. Uh, she lives here in Jersey City. I didn't put her uh, um, her home address there. Uh, the seller is Evelyn Santiago. Uh, the property address is 1225 Kennedy Boulevard in Bayonne. Uh, municipality would be Bayonne. The county would be Hudson. And the lot and block, again, we get that from the tax record, everybody. I'm going to say one thing. Is there a unit number? Unit 9J, yes. Okay. So we probably want to put that in the property address because the lender will require that. Okay. I have, a, it's an older woman, so I had to do everything manually. Okay. <laughs> So I got you. I got you on a complete one. I'm just showing uh, one that okay. was pretty much incomplete. Uh, the purchase price is 180. The total uh, initial deposit. Keller Williams do not accept any deposits. So initial deposit we usually leave at zero. But if they insist that we put a good faith deposit down of a thousand dollars, then it get payable to that listing agent office or to the seller's attorney or buyer's attorney. But here at Keller Williams, we don't take deposits, so it never could come to us. Um, additional deposit, we'll go on your next line. So in this case, this is a cash offer, but we're gonna put 5,000 up front. So 5,000 will go here. She'll be not getting a mortgage, so that is gonna be zero. And the remainder, will be bought at closing of 175. So all three of these numbers in the middle need to make sure it match the purchase offer, the purchase price up top. So if these numbers does not match, then you know you did something wrong if it doesn't match the 180. Karen, I have a question. Yeah. What's the difference between the initial deposit and the additional deposit? So the initial deposit is pretty much just saying, um, this is my good faith deposit. And then the additional deposit will be brought 10 days after attorney review. Um, okay. Linda, is there any difference between the two? It's just a matter of when they are put down. They all go toward the down payment. So the initial deposit sometimes is that deposit that's provided immediately upon signing. The additional deposit is that deposit, and generally it's due within 10 days of the end of attorney review. So if you're, if let's say KW accepted that initial deposit, you could actually write down, usually I see nothing more than $1,000. And they call that a good faith deposit. I'm going to give a good faith of 1,000, saying I'm really interested, here's my $1,000. And then the additional deposit is that money that, let's say, Karen, can we, just, as an example, show them what happens when there's a mortgage? Let, yeah. Let's use that as an example, because that will explain a lot about additional deposit and balance when, it's, when there's not a cash. When it's a cash closing, the a, additional deposit is going to be that money that is in good faith paid up front to show that they're a serious buyer, right? And most times, let's say I'm the buyer's attorney. If let's say you, the, the sell, the buyer says to you, I only want to put a thousand up front and the purchase price is 180,000. You have to instruct them that the seller's attorney is not going to allow you only to put a thousand dollars down and keep the property off the market for 30 days or, or even 21 days if it's cash. Um, they really want to see a good faith. Generally, that's a good, like 5%, I would say. Doesn't have to all be up front. It could be, let's say, 10,000 up front and the balance at closing, but they want to see some good faith deposit. That, that we call that skin in the game, meaning that the buyer is really serious and they're willing to put some money on the line if they turn around and change their mind, which would be breach of contract um, under certain circumstances. So Karen, let's go through if th this was a mortgage and let's say there's no initial deposit since KW doesn't do it. Now, 
Karen, you want to take over or you want me to kind of walk them through? Oh, yeah, you can do it. Okay. So the first question that you have to ask your buyer is when they are getting a mortgage, what is the amount that you are putting down? Is it FHA, which is three and a half percent? Is it a conventional loan? 5% down, 10% down, 20% down. You have to know how much money your client is putting down and financing the rest. So for example, on 180, we'll, we'll, we'll say, let's say that the uh, client tells you, I'm gonna put down 10% and I'm going to finance 90%. Okay, so that would be 10% would be exactly, no, exactly. And then change, uh, yeah, so what would that be? 170, <laughs> 172, maybe? Yes, 172. 162. 162, there you go, perfect. Okay, now, you see how Karen did the deposit she, that's exactly how I would like you to do it. And you're, and it benefits your client. So if they tell you, uh, I am putting 10% down, the total is 18,000. That's a big chunk of change for them to put all of that up front. So what Karen did, and that's exactly what I want you to do is divide it, put a little bit up front and the balance at closing. So I don't know if you could curse, move the cursor, Karen, to the 8,000. So that 8,000, perfect. That's the money that's gonna be due, say within 10 days of the end of attorney review. The next line, 162, that's the amount of the mortgage. That's 90% of the purchase price. That's their mortgage. And the balance of 10,000, that's the remainder of the 10% down. Does everyone get that? Okay. Now, if they were saying, I'm going to put 20% down, then the way that Karen did it is that would be 36,000. At that point, I would say, let's do 10,000 up front and then 26 at closing. You understand all that? Because we don't, I'm not comfortable and I don't think a buyer is going to be comfortable putting all that money up front. It's a lot of money. Okay. And then it would be 180 minus the 36. Perfect. Everybody get that? Awesome. All right, Karen. So our next one is the initial deposit. We didn't do initial deposit, so it's NA. Right. Our additional deposit will be 10 days after AR, which is attorney review. And it's going to be held in most of the time the seller's attorney trust account. So we're going to put seller's attorney trust account. Now remember the principal amount, depending on what they putting down, we left with the 20%. So that would be the 144. The 144 is the principal amount, and the 144 is the amount that's going to go on this line. And it's going to be a conventional. But it could be a FHA 20% down, but most of the time, if you're putting 20% down, it's conventional. Terms of the mortgage generally is 30, and it was stated on their mortgage approval, whether it's 15 or 30, but most of the time, most people get a 30 year payment plan in a 30 year mortgage. And the written mortgage commitment generally is 30 days from when you start the contract, um, give or take the three days after attorney review. So today is the 28th, more than likely we won't get out of attorney review until Friday, which is around the second. So you're looking somewhere around November 2nd before you even get uh, your first mo your mortgage commitment, which is approximately 30 days after attorney review.
Next line is the closing date. When do they want to close? She's cash, so uh, we're going to take that date out. And if you're dealing with the financing, again, remember I said anywhere from 30 to 45 days if it's conventional, 45 to 60 days if it's FHA. So the earliest that we can close on this one being conventional would be somewhere around mid-November. Mid so uh, 14 days from November, from the commitment date, will put us somewhere around the 16th, 18th of the month. Now, again, if it's around the holidays, things slow up. So we got to be conscious that Thanksgiving is the next week. So we want to try to make sure that we don't interfere with the holiday time because the banks slow up, attorneys go on vacation, and everything just slows up. So I'm going to put toward the end of the week because nobody really closes on a Monday or Tuesday. I'm going to put for November the 20th, which is that Friday. And again, sometimes the date is special to a client, so you want their input too. Maybe they have an anniversary on the 21st or whatever date, so you want to have their input as if they're part of the process as well, if, if they have special dates. Always easier to close at the end of the month, it will cost your seller, your buyer, less money if they close at the end of the month as opposed to the beginning of the month, because at the end of the month, the interest have been charged for the month already. If there's anything included or excluded, please don't write as per the MLS. Go and check the MLS. See what's actually on the MLS. See and read if there's anything appliances included. And it's here, dishwasher, refrigerator, gas oven. Copy and paste that, but don't just put as per the MLS because sometimes we don't give the MLS to the uh, attorney so they, they're lost. They don't know what's asked for the MLS. Spell it out for them. They want to see that it's spelled out. If it's excluded, say if it's a chandelier or um, some type of cabinet that is removable, something that, you know, belongs to the seller, then you would put that exclusion there. And many times, if it is something value that is excluded, it will state it in the MLS. So read. Certificate of occupancy, I generally put 250. Um, just generally falls on the seller to do it, but some circumstances, the buyer, it does fall on the buyer. Um, but generally, for Jersey City, we don't have certificate of occupancy, but we do have a smoke certificate. Smoke certificate is about $75 from the city of Jersey City. And then you have to make sure you have the carbon monoxide, fire extinguisher, and um, smoke detectors. So Karen, can, I'm uh, sorry, can I interrupt for one second? Sure. Okay. So this, this raises a really important point, depending on whether you are representing, you know, for, for when you're filling this out, you're presenting the offer. So you have the buyer. What, what I... What I would like is that what Karen is filling in right here is called a cap, a monetary cap on the seller's obligation to get their certificate of occupancy or a smoke cert as in, you know, for Jersey City. Now for a condominium, which I know that I know this property, $250 cap is acceptable it's but if i'm the buyer's agent i want to actually have a high monetary cap because now by the way this is almost irrelevant right now because even bayonne they're not doing interior inspections in covid however what they are checking is whether there's any violations and so the city of Bayonne is way stricter than Jersey City in that if there are records of violations, the city will not issue the CO until the seller closes those out. 
So what this does is let's say there's a violation on this property that our client is buying. This says that the seller has an obligation to get the certificate of occupancy up to a maximum cost of 250. And after 250, either party can pay. And if neither party wants to, the deal can die. So that's, we don't want, we work so hard. By the time we get to closing and the CO, we want that deal to go through. So I'm gonna recommend, and Karen, you, you tell me if, if you um, also agree, that when you're selling, I'm sorry, when you're representing a buyer, other than a condominium, I would recommend that you leave this blank so that there's no cap on the CO, or for a one family, increase it to a thousand, and if it's a multifamily, increase it to 1500. What do you think, Karen? Uh, yeah, that, that's fair. That's fair. So in this case, it's a, it is a condo, so we can leave it at the 250. Exactly, perfect. Very good, thanks for clearing that up. Uh, municipal assessments, again, it will be on the MLS if there is a municipal assessment. Bayonne is still going to do a reval, so I'm not sure if that fall under municipal assessment or has the reval concluded, Linda? We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, I think unless the MLS specifically says, here's the municipal assessments, I wouldn't check either box or at least check has not been notified. Yeah, check has not been notified. If it's not on the MLS. Again, this whole contract, Linda or whichever attorney is going to disapprove it and rewrite it. <laughs> but that's, we have that's so true. And, and everyone, don't stress out about this, all right? You're gonna do great, you're in great hands. And it's true, we, we get these and we, we make the amendments that we need. So don't worry if, you know, you go, oh no, I, I, I didn't forget, don't even, don't even worry about it, okay? So in this case, it's a condo, but if it was a one family, two family, three family, you wanna put it right there um, and state what it is. Tenancy, if there's tenants, please get the tenant name, the location, if they're in apartment one, apartment two, the uh, rent, the security deposit, the terms on their lease. You, you're only gonna get that by speaking to the listing agent and getting that information. Um, and then you put if it's applicable or not applicable. In this case, it's gonna be vacant, so it'll be not applicable. Lead paste paint would be, because it's a building that was built uh, prior to 1978. And again, our lead is on the MLS under D for documents. That's where you let it. Lead is. For your uh, closing, Sellers should have, and you like to see if they can respond back as soon as possible. It says three days. I generally put it down to two. Um, they still don't buy, abide by it, but sometimes you have an agent, they got 24 hours and will spell it out 24 hours to respond or the deal is dead. Um, generally about two days to three is, is sufficient. Point of entry does not apply here in Jersey City. Cesspool, we don't have cesspools. But Linda, I did want to know when I'm putting a cesspool, I generally click off if there is, it's the seller's a responsibility. Should I just be leaving that blank or should we actually indeed be checking seller responsibility? I would love for you to check seller agrees, the first box. Definitely. Next one would be inspections. Uh, everything was slowed down because everybody was in a rush, rush, rush. So they slowed everything down, including inspections, given 14 days. 14 days is a lot 
um, especially when you're dealing with multiple offers and if the inspection come back wrong, now you got to wait another 14 days before you find another buyer, get it on the property, go do attorney review. So I try to cut it down to 10 days. And if we're doing cash, seven days. Keep in mind though, a lot of people are out with houses and the and the inspectors are um, limited. Um, so that seven days may not work. And then you ask an attorney to uh, extend you some more time <laughs> because you couldn't get a, an inspector in seven days. Now this is whole contract. You can read the contract in, in its entirety. And I would suggest y'all all do read it. I'm just going over the blanks of what is absolutely necessary to get it submitted to the attorney and to get your bias to sign. Okay, so this page, again, Keller Williams, the name of the licensee would be yourself. Um, in this case, myself. I am a buyer agent only. Information was supplied by Wipert. They become a seller agent only. Uh, their information now the listing agent can the fill in their own part, but it's just a matter of looking at the MLS actually and getting all their information. And you can get their information just by clicking on their name. And then you'll see most of that information come up. Um, you see their license number on the side here, their office license number, and then of course you put in your information, your license number, KW license number, our information. Down here, the commission, you get that again off the MLS, the bottom, 2.5 minus 275. And that's where your commission would go. You don't care about their commission, whatever they negotiated on their behalf is their business. Don't ever question the listing agent on why they're getting little or more than you. None of your business, whatever they're paying out, that's the only business you're worried about. Disclose that the buyer or seller is a re licensed real estate. In this case, no. Um, if they were, it would be on the MLS because they have to disclose that they're a licensed real estate agent if it's their property. And then back here, you have all the addendums that you need to, whatever you click here has to get submitted to the bank. So as a condo, you have to submit that. Uh, coronavirus, we have to submit that. The lead disclosure, we have to submit that one. If they were taking a sales concession, if it was a short sale, whatever it may be, that's in addition to the contract, the addendum that we signed earlier, those would go to the, along with the contract. Mortgage company needs them. If there was any additional contractual provisions, you would put it here. In this case, she wanted two things. She wanted the bathroom, tub, UV blades, and she wanted the green wall Paint it white. And those were her two provisions that I had to add to the contract. If there's a seller's concession that's needed, you will put your seller's concession uh, toward, actual con toward actual closing costs, prepaid expense, and points up to a certain amount that will all go right in here. And then this one has the wire. Again, I explained once, um, we as realtors, we do not get wire instructions. That comes from the attorney. If your client say they got an email from you, from me, Karen Sims, I know that's absolutely not true because I will never get wire instructions that comes from the attorney. I'm going to instruct my client to hang up. Don't call back that number. Call the attorney directly and, and speak with the attorney. And Linda, if you want to um, elaborate on some of the things that's been going on with Wari so they understand the seriousness of this document. So, Karen, you're absolutely right. 
I even myself um, in my uh, auto response on my email, I have a whole blurb about never wire out unless you call my office first. There's been so much wire fraud, it's frightening. Um, in fact, anytime I give my client a wire instructions, I specifically write in bold, do not wire until you phone my office and go over the instructions verbatim. Um, they're, they're so clever now, these, these crooks, honestly. They intercept the email, they change the routing information, um, there, there's been terrible, terrible wire fraud. So, you know, I wouldn't, I would actually just stay away from directing your client instructions at all about why, or let the attorneys handle it. Thank you. Then we would save and close that one. Karen. Yeah. I have yeah. a question about something that you said. You said, don't worry about the, the, the other commission, um, the seller's commission. I thought the seller and the buyer gets the same amount of commission. Ah, I might negotiate 6% commission, but out of that 6%, I'm only paying out two and a half. If it's a rental- You're getting the commission from the seller, right? The, by the, Listing agent negotiates the commission from the seller. The seller pays out the commission. Uh, the listing agent is the one who determines the split that is being given out. Keller Williams, we give out two and a half percent regardless. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to, if you took a 6% and you wanted to give out three, you absolutely can. If you took a 6% and wanted to give out a two, you absolutely cannot. Our, our guidelines is we give out two and a half percent. Okay, gotcha. But Thanks. as far as being a listing agent, I could take an eight percent and I give you your two and a half percent. And that's what you accept when you showed that you accepted that two and a half percent. That's what you're getting paid. So when my check come in and it's triple of what yours is, you can't question that. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Karen, too. Hi, Linda. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for coming, by the way. I know that you guys are super busy. So um, I'm very thankful we have you here because I'm more curious what's happening after we as an agent actually do everything properly. It goes to you guys for review. We after the review. And then, you know, we're dealing with a lot of coronavirus. Um, you said it, right? The inspectors are busy. Everything is being postponed. And uh, so my question is, um, what, ha what happened basically when, let's say that the inspection doesn't go well or the appraisal goes well, who really changing the riders? Who is really negotiating? Is it you or is it going back to us or how does it work really in practice? That's a great question. Well, first you, you asked two points. One was inspection, one was appraisal. Both of those are negotiated through the lawyers. Um, Sometimes the realtors become very, very involved in the inspection resolution because there's a, sometimes there's a, a relationship between the agents and the agents will say, uh, you know, oh, well, Linda's office is requesting 10,000 on behalf of a buyer and the buyer and the seller's attorney came back with five. And sometimes you have conversations with the realtors saying, you know, have you talked to your client? Have you talked to your client? But as far as let's say we get an inspection report, my office will request from the buyer a list of major demands. And then I will prepare uh, a demand letter, sending it to the buyer along with you copying you on, on the correspondence, requesting approval of the demand letter. We then send it to the seller's attorney for consideration. Sometimes the clients are just too far apart and we can't save the deal. More instances than not, there's a, there's a happy medium in the middle. Um, and that's, that's really what happens. As far as appraisal, it's, a, it's very similar, handled by the attorneys. Let's say our clients are buying a house for 300,000, it comes in at 280 and 
in my review letters, I always put an appraisal contingency. So if it under appraises, I give my buyer the opportunity to terminate if the parties can't reach an agreement, which is you know, very, very important because most buyers cannot make up that difference um, with an under appraisal because you can only borrow what the appraised value is. So in that example, if it comes in at 280, you now have that buyer has to come up with an extra $20,000 to, to the selling price together with closing costs and the money down. And most people don't have that, those funds available. So, the, so I will always put in an appraisal contingency in my review letter. If it under appraises, I send it off to the seller's attorney and say, here's a copy of the appraisal. Please confirm seller's willingness to reduce the selling price equal to the appraised value. Sometimes the parties meet in the middle. So in my example, if they're 20,000 apart, sometimes the, the buyer loves the property so much that he says, well, I'll, I'll come up 10 grand if the seller comes down 10, okay? But those two issues are, sh should be initially handled by the attorney for the buyer. Great, thank you so much. So um, one more question, follow up on it. Um, as I mentioned, we all struggling about the corona and the coronavirus uh, clause there, right? So we're trying to be very flexible about the times. And I see now riders when we see, oh, let's be flexible and everything. But obviously I, as a real estate person, also want to help, right? So how do you, for example, how, what, what would you recommend us to help you? Like in terms of like, let's give you example, like, Obviously, you need to have condominium, the homeowner addendum, right? Like who is responsible for it? Is it the buyer agent or is it the seller agent? Or you know what I mean, right? Basically, the, uh, the seller agent have access usually to the HOA, needed to gather information for the buyers as soon as possible. I think that it's usually within seven days of the review for um, the buyer get the get the information that they basically can start doing the appraisal, right? And have all the info, but what, what is the best practice how to deal with the real estate pe people who like takes care of it? Do the real estate people talking or do you guys talking as a, as a lawyers between each other? What's the best practice? What would you recommend? So as far as the coronavirus, luckily, you know, that was really, really, relevant in March, April, May, and, and I would say even half of June. Um, thankfully, we're not seeing the slowdown that we did in terms of access, uh, in terms of HOA responses. I do know that there are some developments that are still completely remote. And the turnaround time for, that, for those documents, for instance, the you know, condo fees, the management, the bylaws, all of those things are relevant when, when you have a buyer purchasing a condominium. And I do ask for all of those in my review letter. Sometimes the agents uh, facilitate getting those documents over to me. But what happens is, is that as soon as attorney review is over, I will send a letter to the management company via email, again, copying all of you saying, I represent the buyer. Here's what what I need. I need uh, a copy of the bylaws. I need a copy of the budget. I need a copy of the rules and regulations. So I will facilitate getting those things. Um, your, the lender will also send those requests because they have specific requirements, which is called a condo questionnaire. Um, but the best thing that you as the agents can do is stay on top of the of the lender a little bit. Uh, if you have, if you've, if you've worked with the lender and you know that the, that your buyer's lender is on the money and they're great and they're responsive, you can kind of hang back and make sure checking in with your client has the lender received the condo questionnaire, has the lender ordered the appraisal, you know, things like that. Other lenders are not as responsive and they make our jobs harder. Um, and those lenders, we have to constantly hound, have you received this? Have you done this? And, th and if they haven't, we're going to do whatever we can to expedite the process because the, our goal is 
Let's get all the information to the lender so that lender can issue a mortgage commitment. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Super thankful, That's super helpful. Thank you so much. And again, sure. appreciate because I know that you guys are working very hard, Linda. So Thank you. Yeah. You Linda, too. <laughs> Linda, I have a question for you too. Um, when a property is under contract, um, does the seller, can the seller still accept offers, but only if it's higher? That is such a good question. The answer is as long as the property is still in attorney review, the seller is entitled to entertain other offers. So this is critical as a buyer's agent that we do our very, very best the minute that contract is fully executed, get it over, begin attorney review immediately, and my office will push the seller's attorney for a response. Now, sometimes we don't have cooperation on the seller's part. The seller will stall, the seller will purposely not answer his attorney. The attorney sometimes responds to me, I'm sorry, my client is unavailable or my client's not responding to me or, and the purpose of that sometimes, and it's sad, but true, they will keep it on the market because they know it's a hot property and they want to see what is going to be their final and best. Now, luckily for all of us, that does not happen a lot. Most instances that when we go under contract, we have a, I'll say, uh, you know, a reputable seller that will do the right thing and, and with intentions of proceeding with your client, okay? Proceeding with the good faith of getting out of attorney review. But the, when we don't have that, believe me, my office, the minute we get a contract, we, Karen knows, we send that review letter, honestly, unless there's some very extenuating circumstances, that letter goes out the same day. And if I don't have a response by that afternoon, the next morning I'm saying, following up on status of attorney review. So it is really important that until we get out of review, we are diligently pursuing the seller's attorney to respond to us. Because you, to your question, until we get out of review, the seller is entitled to kick us out for any reason. It doesn't have to just be a higher offer. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any more questions, guys? Don't be shy. If there's no more questions. I'm going to show you how to select the document, get them over to DocuSign, get them out to the buyer to get signed so that we can... Can I have can I have actually one more question? Sorry about that. So I'm sorry. Um, so I have one more question. I deal in David, sometimes um, it drives me nuts. Um, very often, if I'm on the seller side, I get um, the contract for sale and I get missing information, like the lot is missing, the blah, the name of the sellers. And sometimes I get like, oh, don't worry, the attorney just, will fill it up how do you feel about that like how, how are you guys feeling about that when you're getting very important information and they're not filling is it true should i just be next time like oh that's fine the the lawyers will take care of it or do you think that important information like actually having the correct address having the name of the seller and buyer having actually the lot and the blood there is it what, what's your thought about that my my thought is that the more complete the contract, the better, so that it doesn't get kicked back and needs recirculation from the lender. So if there is a missing block and lot, what's going to happen is the lender is going to say, ah, the first page doesn't have the lot and block. We need an addendum. We need a revised first page. Now it has to be re-executed. That's, that's a pain in the neck for everybody, okay? If it's missing the seller's name, same thing. It's got to be re-executed because don't forget with DocuSign in particular, the minute that you change anything on that contract, if it's executed, 
it changes it from now eliminating all the signatures. Have you, know, have you ever seen that? So if you edit a document in DocuSign, it removes the signatures after, after it's signed. So it's not the end of the world, but ideally you want the contract as complete as possible. Definitely the correct address. Just today, I have a closing that's happening in two days and the lender notices the property address is not correct on the contract. It says Ruble, let's say, uh, for example, it says Ruble Street, it's Ruble's Court. That alone caused us to have a delay, go back, get the addendum signed, hurry up, hurry up, I need this by two o'clock or it's not closing tomorrow, you know, things like that. So the more complete would be, would be wonderful for, for everyone involved. Now, if you have an uncooperative seller's agent, that's a different story. Get it to me and I'll, I'll figure it out by addendum, okay? But that is also true in tenant information. When we get the contract, a lot of times, the way Karen explained it to, to you all, to fill in what type of property is it? Is it a one family? Is it a two family? So many times that information is blank and I, I then have to first make some phone calls because I don't know if it's a one or a two or a condo or a three. And there are different paragraphs that I include in my review letter, depending on the type of property. It is very significant for me to know what kind of property they are buying. Also, the tenant information. Very often, the tenant information is blank. It's not checked. I don't know if it's applicable or not applicable. So if there's a tenant, right? and it's not checked, and there's no tenant information in the contract, and my client says, I want the property vacant, I say, okay, great. Until I get a response from the seller's attorney that says there's a first floor tenant. Now I have to go back to my client, our client, and say, I'm really sorry, we have a tenant on the property. So the more that you can supply the contract and making it complete and, and uh with, with names and type of property and tenant information and block and lot, the, the better. Got it, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? You got it, guys? Thank you, this was the best. Each class is the best, but this one was the best information I that is so sweet, thank you. <laughs> so once we finish with everything, we're gonna grab the documents we need. The pencil is actually gonna help us get to the actual signing of the documents that we need to get to the, to the buyer. There's a lot of documents, so it may take a few seconds for it to download and pop up. And if anybody don't need Linda and Linda wanna go, we appreciate you coming. We thank you. Linda is on our attorney vetted list. She has business cards here. You can stop in Bayonne, say hi, pick up some from yourself. But again, she's a great attorney and I would love for y'all to continue putting her in your uh, books to use. Thank you so much, Karen. And just so you all know, you're in amazing hands. If you ever have a question, like I said, even if I don't have your file, I'm, I'm really accessible. You can email me. You can phone me, I am happy to help you. Even if you have questions filling out a contract and Karen's not available, give me a shout. I'm happy to help you all. And I look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, have a great day. Thank you, you too. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Down here, you add your recipients. You can pre-tag your room. Uh, we're working with the buyer, so it's going to be buyer one that we're looking for signatures. And then we'll go find their name. In this case, it was Grace. And then you, as the buyer agent, you want to sign your document. And when you pre-tag it, the computer will do a lot of the work for you and drop in the signatures where they need to go. Down at the bottom, you can send your client a little message. You can add the address. This is 1225 JFK, unit 9J. And you can say, hey, Grace, 
please review and sign. If you have any questions, blah, 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 whatever you want to write for your, to your client. And then up here on your right-hand side, you're going to hit the next button. When you hit the next button, it's going to bring in the documents like this. And you will see, let me move you out the way. Down the bottom, it has the blue. Blue is Grace, yellow is me. It has where she needs to sign. And it'll go pre-tag mostly all your pages you need for the buyer. In this case, purchaser and buyer are one and the same. And you just verifying that the computer didn't skip over anything. Otherwise, you would put it in. See how it's putting in all the signatures there for you? This way, it already pre tag and you don't have to move it to the right to the left. You see how I put my name in there now? And now, if you miss something, like I didn't put prepared by, you would just go put a text in. And then you can type in that text. You would type your name or whatever it is that you missed on that document. And it would be there. Um, it's going to put all the initials down the bottom. And you just pretty much verifying that everything that was supposed to get a signature, got a signature. Now remember the lead base, I'm just gonna go to the lead. A lot of times it doesn't put the witness, you are the witness, it is your client's contract. So you could just add your signatures on. On a lead based paint, it will not put it because this is not a form that came from the documents. This was a form that I uploaded. So when I go to do the lead, oh, look at there. It did upload the lead. Oh, wait a minute. This is, I pulled in the unsigned lead. Remember, we don't want the unsigned lead because we don't know what the seller did. So this would be the wrong lead that you wouldn't want to use that one. You would want to go to the lead that you actually pulled in from the MLS because you see here the seller said they had no knowledge, they had no report. So this one is not going to put the uh, initials or the signatures for you. So you have to manually put it in. So each line will get its own initial. Now with uh, dot loop, dot loop don't let you override each one. This gives a 10 day opportunity. You do the check box right here and you put the check box so that they can check it. And then for her name, signature and date. Dot loop, the date comes up when you put it there. DocuSign, it doesn't, you have to make sure you put the date. Then my signature and my date. And then once you have all your documents complete, a lot of time I like sending over the information for the MLS along with the uh, property tax. Then you just hit send, the computer send it. Now the ML, you'll see it, it'll come up with uh, the email address for the recipient is invalid. Remember, she's an older woman, she doesn't have email. So that's why I had to print it. Um, but if I put it in a dummy email, it would just go and go to that email address. I just wanted to do it so that you could get up to this point where you see me hit send and it goes out after all the signatures. But that concludes everything that you need to do in reference to your client. When the contracts do come back, the documents that you would need to present to the listing agent, because the listing agent don't need your exclusive buyer agency agreement. 
they don't need your uh, attorney um, general memoranda. They don't need your uh, exclusive by agency or informed consent to do an agency or your affiliated attorney list or your vetted your gravity title. What the actual agent needs, let me just say cancel for this. What your client, act, what the MLS other agent, listing agent actually need is that lead statement. They need your coronavirus disclosures, both of them. They need your condominium homeowners association agenda, the coronavirus, both of them showing in a whole harmless and the uh, one to cancel. They need the contract. Uh, whole harmless, sorry, said that wrong, right? And the wire. Those are the only forms that, out of this whole package when your signed contract come back that the listing agent would need you to send to them. And the way you would send that to them, you can select the ones that were signed. If it was multiple ones, it, it's going to be multiple ones. Select the ones you need it signed. Contract. Uh, whole harmless. Coronavirus. Condo. Wire. And then right here, you see where it says email. You can either download it. You download it. It's going to come in a zip file. I hate that I don't know how to work and extract with the zip files. So I never really download it. What I do, I hit email and then I email it to myself. And then once I email it to myself, then I go take that email and send it to my client or send it to the listing agent. You see how the documents will come here to the email. They're all there. And then you can forward it to whomever you need to forward it to. Again, their information is, their email is associated on the MLS down here in the email address. And that's how you get the other agent's information. I'm going to stop sharing. And if there's any questions, I'm, I'm ready. Karen, I have one. Does it matter who signs first, you or the client? No, okay. it doesn't. Um, uh, the, the proof of funding, like, is that just the, like the pre-approval? Uh, so if I'm doing cash, no, I have actual, uh, bank statements. Okay. Um, that I uploaded and when you're working with your client, on their behalf, and you send them bank statements. I'm just going to show you. I white it, you know, black marker, so that nobody see her account number. Gotcha. And then where was her own home private address where she lived on the pre-approval uh, first page? Have her address on it. I put a highlighter over it because I don't want, you know, I'm protecting her interest. She's an older woman with money. So you don't want nothing to happen. You don't think nothing will happen, but you never know. So you protect their privacy too by writing out their information with their proof of funds. So you'd write out her address too? The address too? Yeah, the address. I took off her address, her personal address, and her... Uh, account number to her account. I only show the dollar amount in her name. Any other questions? Well, we got Jean Rivers coming up. Who's coming in the office? I'll be here. I do, I do. I cannot wait, Mandula. <laughs> 
Everybody that's come in the office told uh, John Carlos or Jasmine or Patricia so we can make sure we account for lunch. Yes. Very good. I know I did. <laughs> I'm not coming to the office yet. <laughs> I'm not ready. No. Oh, okay, I, okay. I, I started with you guys without mask. It was enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we all keep our social distance, but it'd be fun to get together and, and, and train all together. Yeah. And bounce off each other for, you know, knowledge and, and, and wisdom. Yes. So I'll see y'all Wednesday. I'm excited. I can't wait. <laughs> me too. All right. Yeah. Have a good day. You too. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.